This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Sudan, where mass protests continue to call for civilian rule following last month's military coup. On Monday, Transitional Military Council said that it has reached an agreement with protest leaders on a transitional power structure. Demonstrators have been demanding a transfer from military to civilian rule following last month's military coup that ousted longtime leader Omar al-Bashir. Uh, the announcement comes after at least six protesters and a member of, secu of the security forces were killed when, sec when security and military troops opened fire on crowds outside military headquarters quarters in the capital Khartoum uh, Monday. Dozens more were injured. Also on Monday, deposed President Omar al-Bashir was charged in the killing of protesters during the popular uprising, which led to his overthrow last month. One of the deaths being investigated is that of a doctor who was shot dead while assisting injured protesters. The Central Committee of Sudan Doctors says 90 people were killed during the months-long and still ongoing protests. Demonstrators have vowed to continue to sit in and march until the government's transition to 100 percent civilian rule. Well, for more, we're joined by Maureen al Neil, a Sudanese activist based here in New York City. Um, she was just in Sudan, where she was detained. Uh, Maureen, can you give us an update on what's taking place? I mean, the most astounding um, image in the last weeks of, ultimately, the protesters forcing out uh, the dictator, the long-reigning dictator, um, but then charging that a kind of military coup was taking place. Talk about the um, what's happened. What has happened, the updates since the ousting of Omar al-Bashir, is that the declaration of freedom and change forces have been uh, in negotiation with the so-called transitional military council. The most recent updates is that, uh, with the press conference that happened yesterday, they have announced that they've reached an agreement on a few points. Some of them is that they'll have a transitional period of up to three years. Um, first six months being for peace building and the stopping of the war. They've also agreed on a legislative council that will have 300 members, 67 percent of which they're going to be uh, elected or uh, appointed by the Declaration of Freedom and Change Forces. 33 percent are from other bodies um, not clearly defined yet. They have also agreed on uh, um, an investigative committee uh, on the events of the massacre of May 13th. And they've also agreed um, on a committee that's going to be a joint committee between um, the military and the field committees of the Declaration of Freedom and Change Forces. Uh, this basically means the on-the-ground protesters. This committee will be for keeping the safety and security within the sit-in. That kind of indicates that both the Transitional Military Council and the Declaration of Freedom and Change Forces, um, they're uh, expecting that the sit-in will continue for some time and it's not going to be ending soon. Um, the one thing that they have not agreed upon yet, or at least have not um, declared to the public is um, the Sovereign Leadership Council. And that is the most important point. Who's going to be in the council? Are there going to be our, uh, military uh, personnel represented? Who are these uh, personnel? And what is the percentage? This council is supposed to be non-hierarchical. Every member, member should have uh, their voices have equal weight. But it's going to be difficult or practically impossible for um, the civilian people and the military uh, representatives in the council to have equal weight. And uh, at the end of the day, the military uh, personnel have an army under their command. Well, and that's uh, that's the problem of the popular uprisings that overthrow a long-term dictator, that the opposition has is not organized and has, has its political parties and its organizations in place, but the military obviously does. So it's a lot easier for them to ch attempt to assume control. For instance, in Egypt and other places, we've seen the popular movements crushed as a result of the fact that the opposition was not united. So how do you see this transition period working itself out, or do you think that the military is going going to try to re-exert it itself and maintain control of the country. The protesters have been drawing a lot of parallels with Egypt, and they've been using it as a cautionary tale, uh, uh, you know, uh, reassuring each other that we should take it slow to make sure that the military does not take over and it remains a revolution of the people. Um, another aspect is that the military is not so united as it might seem. Uh, for example, we've seen that uh, in the police there's a movement called Lieutenant and Under, where you've seen unionization within the police. And we've also seen um, uh, uh, 
people in the army who are uh, refusing the orders of their superiors and siding with the people. Uh, there have been the famous Hamid, who tried to protect the people during uh, the events of uh, April 6 and 7 and 8, when there were cl uh, clashes between the army and the rapid support forces at the sit-in. And who was Hamid? Who was that? What this happened? was Hamid. Uh, Hamid is a lower-ranking officer in the army, and he's became, uh, become famous for siding with the people. I want to turn to one of the protesters who was wounded on Monday in violence that broke out after the political transition deal was made between the mainstream opposition and military rulers. This is Raed Mubarak. I took a bullet. He shot a bullet at me. He was 20 meters away from me at most. He saw me and he meant to shoot me. It was intentional, I mean. The bullet should have hit me. He did not even shoot at my leg or up in the air. He shot at my chest, at the left, intending to hit my heart. He meant to kill me, not to scare me or anything. So that is a protester. Um, so you have the military opening fire on the protesters, killing a number of them, and yet at the same time, Omar al Bashir is in the very prison that he sentenced so many opposition to, um, where so many people were tortured. He now is there and just charged with murder uh, for suppressing protests and killing protesters. The charges that have been presented uh, at Omar al-Bashir are not sufficient. Uh, at the end of the day, if he's charged for killing of the protesters, who, who has he been ordering? Has he been ordering the military? Then his generals should also be charged. His generals are still at the military council. If it's, it was through the National Intelligence and Security Services, then Salah Ghosh, the former director, should also be charged, and maybe other figures, prominent figures, at uh, National Intelligence and Security Services. If it's through the rapid support for, uh, forces. Uh, um, uh, being uh, led by uh, Himeti, then also Himeti should be charged. So these charges, we, the protesters uh, realize that um, the military council might try to scapegoat Omar al Bashir for other generals and other prominent figures to be able to stay in power. What's been the posture of some of the neighboring states that might be affected in one way or another by the uprising in Sudan? Think, I'm thinking specifically of Ethiopia and Egypt. Uh, how have they been re, uh, reacting uh, to the revolution that's been occurring in your country? The protesters have been very wary about international intervention. Uh, recently, we have uh, seen that some of the Declaration of Freedom and Change forces, or some of the, the, the forces that have signed the declaration, have uh, had meetings in, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they've seen a great backlash by the protesters, saying that if we're allowing these people to have a say in our revolution, then they will make sure that some things continue with the transitional government, such as our involvement in Yemen. And these are one of the, the, the demands of the protesters is that we bring back uh, the people who have been fighting in Yemen, a lot of them child soldiers. Can you talk about the role of women in leading the opposition and the protests in the streets, and how large are these protests still? The protest, especially the sit-in, has been expanding. Initially, it was only at uh, in front of the military headquarters. Now it's expanding to other major streets, such as Nile Street, where the protesters have been attacked on May 13th. Uh, the, uh, the role of the women, um, you can see it in the numbers of the women at the sit-in, and you can also see it in the leadership uh, roles that they're playing on the ground, uh, leading some movements um, in the ground so, and, and other initiatives that are not directly towards the, 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 the transition, but such things as uh, the education of uh, the street children who have taken shelter at the sit-in. Uh, you see it in uh, the large number of uh, female doctors who are helping on the ground, and, of course, just the, 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 the protesters. And what happened to you when you were there? Um, I was there during December and January. Uh, we've seen uh, similar violence uh, to May 13th on January 17th. Uh, this is when uh, Dr. Babikir wa was uh, shot, and uh, two other people have lost their lives that day. And uh, 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 hundreds of people were detained, including myself and other friends and family members. Uh, we remained detained for six days, um, and we were released. We, we do not know why we were detained, and we do not know 
why we were released. And I think that's the case with a lot of other protesters as well. And, and you're planning to return? Uh, what, are you, what are you hoping to do when you get back there? Things are moving so fast, I'm not even sure how it will be when I return. I will be arriving uh, to Sudan on Sunday. I might see uh, a transitional government, or I, I do expect that I will see protesters um, uh, protesting what the Declaration of Freedom and Change forces have agreed upon. If they are allowing too many or specific people from the military to be on the Sovereign Leadership Council, I'm, I'm hoping to join those protests that will be calling for a more fair representation of civilians and for certain figures such as uh, Abdel Fattah Burhan and Himeti to not be on the council because uh, there's, uh, there needs to be a due process of, of accountability. Hmm. We want to thank you so much, Maureen Al-Neil, uh, for joining us. Sudanese activists based here in New York City, uh, recently back from Sudan, headed back there. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for paid six-month internships here in our New York studio. Learn more and apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warnoff, Sam Alcoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masu, Charina Nadura, Tay Maria Studio, and Libby Rainey. Mike DeFilippo and Miguel Nagara engineers. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.